Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Lazio Lounge. Number two of Lazio icons, Alessio McKenzie, as you decided to call it. We had Alessandro Nesta, first Lazio icon. And the second one, we decided to do a poll, Alessio, and uh, who is the winner? Well, there wasn't a winner, to be honest. With. <laughs> <laughs> it finished as a draw, which we didn't really expect, um, between Simone Inzaghi and Beppe Signori. And given that... Um, well, I think everyone already knows the Simone Inzaghi story relatively well and uh, that you're in love with Beppe Signori. I think it's probably makes a lot of sense for us to, to go and have a look back at, at what he was up to. Well, yeah, come on. I think uh, he's one of the legends of this club. Uh, he, he did so many things positive for this club. And uh, as I often said in this podcast, I think you can remember... It's a disgrace that he didn't win nothing with Lazio. I thought he deserved to win something. And, uh, you know, maybe he's the only one of these heroes of our club that uh, left in a different way. You know, Nesta uh, have, have been sold because Lazio was struggling financially. Here was a completely different story. We're going to talk about that because, I mean, it's a big part of... of uh, Simone, eh, Simone, Beppe Signori history. Uh, let's start saying that he was the first signing of the of Sergio Cagnotti. The the golden era of Lazio started with Beppe Signori. Even though uh, Cagnotti wasn't still the owner, he already made the deal. The deal was made in January and then was made officially in June, if I'm not wrong. And uh, first thing. Cagnotti did was signing Beppe Signori. Uh, I think you were too young, but uh, Foggia, Zeman's Foggia, reached Serie A, and you know no one gave it credit to them. And the first year they were able to to keep the Serie A division, and big part of that was thanks to Zeman type of football. Signori, Rambaudi, uh, Baiano was the three strikers playing there, and Lazio decided to make the move. Eleven. Uh, it wasn't Euros, it was still a leader for 11 million euros for Beppe Signori. And uh, there were a lot of question marks, Alistair, <clears throat> because you know, uh, it was his only second year in Serie A, paying all that money for a striker who played well. With, with Foggia, but nothing huge. Yeah. There, were, there were a lot of concern, and I still remember a lot of people before the first match of that season that was Sampdoria-Lazio was concerned. You know, Lazio was starting to build up to become a team to fight for the, the UEFA competition at that time, and there were question mark about Beppe Signori. And the first match, hat-trick from Beppe Signori, and I think all the doubts disappeared in just one match. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I think it's a really interesting start to his career, actually, in the way he joins Lazio. Like you say, you've just kind of summarized it all very nicely there. But um, when, when I was having a look at this, I found it really interesting, the, the circumstances around his arrival. Like you say, quite a few questions, because he wasn't by any means a household name at this point. And I found it really interesting looking at the impact that Zeman had on his career, especially at Foggia, because... This was a guy who'd been released. He was, he was a youth player. Inter had been released because he was too small. Uh, we've heard that story a few times with Messi as well. <laughs> same, same kind of player. Um, and then, you yeah. Was better, but okay. <laughs> but, but looking at his career in those, in those early leagues, this, there wasn't really, in those early years, there weren't really many signs that this guy was in the ascendancy. He was about to become a massive Serie A star because... You know, he's playing in Serie C, you know, the third or fourth tier, really, of Italian football. And he's not playing as a striker. He's playing as a midfielder half the time or, or as a number 10, maybe. And then apparently there's a story about when, when he arrived at uh, Foggia and Zeman had seen him um, play when he was in charge of Messina. And, and as soon as Signori came through the door, Zeman said, welcome, bomber. And Signori was kind of like, what are you talking about? I'm not a striker. And I was like, well, you are now. <laughs> and, uh, 
And then through, I think, a series of injuries they had at Fudge at the time as well, he ended up having to play as well as spotting that Signori could play as a striker. He kind of had to play him there. And that was basically how he ended up in that role. But I found that really interesting because we were talking just last week with Nesta about how, you know, Zeman's style of football might have helped Nesta in his development in that, you know, it left Nesta in this kind of covering role where he basically had to defend by himself all the time. But uh, I found it interesting coming across the Zeman link two weeks in a row. Um, and, and one thing really important, the doubts about Signori coming to Rome, is that he was leaving Zeman to go to Dino Zoff, who was a very defensive mind manager. And a lot of people was saying, you know, he scored a lot of goals because of Zeman. Now he's coming to Rome. Lazio is not playing with a 4-3-3. He will struggle to to perform as well, uh, especially because with Dino Zoff, Lazio wasn't scoring that much, that many goals. So there were a lot of question marks, and uh, he started immediately playing that so well that you know a lot of question marks disappeared after the first match. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean. Uh... It was the first game of the season, right, against Sampdoria. And it's worth remembering that at this time, this isn't the Sampdoria we now know. This no. was a Sampdoria side that was you know, managed by Spanier and Eriksson and had just been in the European Cup final. This is a proper Sampdoria team. And uh, like you say, immediately, I think he scored two goals in, in the first 15, 20 minutes, something like that. But was it from your perspective, I mean... When you think of Signori with Lazio, you kind of think of this fan favourite icon, and obviously we'll get on to later examples of that as well, but how quickly did he become a fan favourite? Was it as soon as that match was over, everyone had changed their minds about him, or was it just over the course of that first season? Well, he had a terrific first season, you know, and uh, one thing of Signori that catches the fan is that when you see him playing, you see that he really gives everything and he's someone that hates losing. So, you know, fans love seeing people reacting like that in the pitch, uh, seeing players that don't care, maybe don't show it, but uh, it's, it's not what you want to see. Instead, Signori was the type of player that he wanted to score all the time, every time. And uh, when he was playing, he was giving everything, really everything. You can see him, and he said it, you know, when when the match is over, I'm destroyed because I gave everything. But that's the type of football of Beppe Signori. And so uh, fans started to love him. Plus, he was scoring, you know, every single week. So uh, Ciro Mobile beat the record of Beppe Signori with Lazio. But, you know, I'm always saying, I think Ciro Mobile is a great striker, but he had... Luis Alberto behind him, had Correa, Milinko Savic, and so on. If you go and watch that Lazio, that wasn't really a good team. You know, I'm not saying it was a bad team, but definitely without Signori, that was a below average team. With, you know, Roberto Cravero was the central defender, and he was, you know, the best years of his life was already gone with Torino. Uh, Kaziragi was a great striker, but improved thanks to, to Zeman. He, I would say there wasn't a real star apart from Beppe Signor in that team. All good players. Well, the only thing I was going to say was that he arrived at the same time as Gaza, which sometimes be, got a bit forgotten. And I suppose it's a lot to his credit that he ended up being the, the better signing of the two, which nobody would have expected at the time, right? Yeah, but how many matches did Gaza play, you know? Unfortunately, it's a big difference, right? Uh, Gascoigne was arrived injured, so he didn't start that season. And, uh, yeah, that was a big problem. Apart from that, let's not forget that Lazio signed Gascoigne, who was injured the first year. And so all the money Lazio spent on Gaza, you know, they couldn't reuse it to sign another great player. So that's why I'm saying that Pepe Signori was, was the rising star of the team. Yeah, and I mean, to put this in context, um, like you say, this wasn't yet the Sergio Cragnotti team that we kind of grew to, to know and love in the Scudetto winning years and the European Cup winning years and all that. But he was still, he won Capo Cagnonieri in three of his first four seasons at Lazio. 
which is an unbelievable return. I mean, as looking at this, you know, 26 goals in his first season, 23 in his second, and then 24 in his fourth. And this is at a time as well when I was kind of having a look at those, the Capo Cannonieri charts, and you've got Roberto Baggio, Batistuta, Marco Van Basten in the early years, uh, Gianfranco Zola. I mean, there are some serious talents, you know, uh, at this time in Serie A, and he is three out of four seasons at a team that isn't winning the league, that isn't expected to be challenging to win the league necessarily at that point. So... I suppose my next question to you is how important do you think he was as a player in that transition? Because from his arrival in 92 to when he left um, around 98, I think it was, that really was the the period in which Lazio kind of emerged under Cragnotti as as challengers and as a team that are capable of winning major honours. But how big a role do you think Signori had in, in helping them make that transition? I think he was really important. And one thing about the Capo Cannonieri, remember that in that period, there were Cannavaro, Maldini, Baresi, Costa Cu- You know, Lazio was playing against great defenders. You don't have those type of defenders now in Serie A. So scoring all those goals against these defenders it's not easy. It's absolutely not easy. This tells you how good uh, Beppe Signori was. And, uh, you know, I think I think he was a leader of the team. And the fact that he became captain of the team is because everybody considered him, you know, like a, like a leader. And probably when Cragnotti came, and we said it already in the other podcast about Nesta, he didn't care that much about the defense. He was looking more uh, to sign strikers, etc. That that Lazio defense was terrible. We said it when Nesta, before Nesta coming, you know, we played with Cravero, Gregucci as central defenders. So uh, Lazio in that time was a was a defense was a team that was scoring a lot of goals but allowing a lot of goals. So most of the time Lazio had, you know, was was relying on Beppe Signori even because. Caroline Trider, that was the striker that started with Gascoigne, uh, was a great player, but he wasn't scoring that many goals. He was more creating chances for, for the other players to score. So um, I think Beppe Signori changed a little bit the attitude of that team. And uh, yeah, I think he, you know, he, it, I start going to the stadium when Beppe Signori start playing for Lazio. So, you know, uh, I, I thought he changed the, the era, the, the how people was watching Lazio, you know. Before Lazio was a small team. When Pepe Signori came, things things changed. Yeah, I was going to say, and to add, you know, the, the timing of it as well, this is not only a time where the, he is helping with that transition, like I say, to Lazio challenging, but it's also he arrives at a time when Lazio really not that far off coming out of a period of really bad times in Serie B and the, yeah, the, some of the dark years, really. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the impression I get as well with Signori is that, obviously, it was too early in my life to be watching his live matches much. Um, well, I did it's never too early. Bologna, but, uh, but I've seen an awful lot of his goals over the years and clips of games and highlights and so on, and... One of the impressions I've always had of Signori is that he was one of these players um, who is just, he makes football fun. And there was something about him and the way he scored his goals that made you love him as well. I, beyond, you know, like you've mentioned, the leadership and the actual return of his goals and, and how consistent he was and everything else. There is just something for me about the way he scored goals that just seems amazing. And I, I was having another kind of nostalgic look at earlier on today and that the volley he scores in that in the in the Rome derby in in uh, 94 um I mean it's just an unbelievable goal in his weaker foot um but I mean there's there's tons of these things and there's the penalties the free kicks he scored a hat trick of free kicks like Mihailovic um way before Mihailovic and I, I mean just unbelievable technique so do you think that's part of it as well the kind of legend of Signori is that he was just a lot of fun to watch. Is that too simplistic? 
no, not too simplistic. The fact is, you watch him and say, you know, he's not the type of player that can dominate it with it, with his body. Uh, yeah, he's fast, but you say, you know, he's going to do always the same thing. Instead, he, he was uh, terrible. If you give him, you know, one meter, he could score and find the, the perfect angle. The other thing I loved about Beppe Signori is that every time he was Lazio had a penalty, I was so confident that he would score. And, you know, maybe it's because I was younger, I don't know, but I never had the confidence, that confidence again. Ciro Mobile, for example, scares me a lot when he's when he's taking a penalty. Tommaso Rocchi was terrible at penalties. Uh, even Mihalovic missed a penalty, you know. Beppe Signori, I was so confident. And uh, and that was his style, you know. I, as a kid of that era, I started taking penalties like Beppe Signori. And no run-up. Yeah, you know, without, without standing there and, and shooting. And I think half Rome did it, you know. And, that, was and, actually, that was actually one of the comments we got um, on Facebook. Joe Fraetta wrote to us and he basically said as a he was a freak, the best penalty taker, and then goes on to say he's very unlucky to play in the same era as, era as Baggio, was always second to him, but was Lazio's greatest. He was the reason why I followed and always will follow Lazio. Um, I think we'll get on to the Baggio and Italy thing a bit later yeah. on. But talking about the penalties, though, I mean, I heard a great um, story about that as well, that he, he was inspired. Apparently, he missed a penalty um, I think it was while he was at Foggia. It might have been his first penalty. He took a run-up and he missed. And then he got inspired. He was watching darts on TV, watching a darts tournament, and was inspired by the fact that darts players never take a run-up. And so they go for accuracy instead of power. That's so the story goes. And so he decided to start doing the same thing, where instead of going for power, he would just pick his spot. And then there was an interview with him where he talks about the way he would read goalkeepers, which is quite interesting, where he basically said, and it sounds very simple once you've heard it, but he basically said, you know, 99% of the time, a goalkeeper will give away which way they're going to go because one of their knees will bend, and that's because they will be about to push off from that knee in the opposite direction. So he'd just have a look at the goalkeepers, see which knee is bent, and then shoot in that direction, and usually it would work. Yeah, I remember that part of the knee. And uh, I, I remember he said that one of the reasons why he's taking penalty like that is because, yes, he's probably losing power because obviously like that you don't have that much power. But at the same time, you take out the tempo to the goalkeeper who hasn't got the chance to push more and, you know, take a step and, and dive. So uh, for, for a striker, it's very difficult. But as he was very balanced, he could uh, be very accurate and still have power to kick the penalty like that. And, you know, for goalkeepers, it was terrible because uh, you didn't have time to dive. And uh, I, I don't know. I was very confident when Beppe Signori was taking a penalty. He missed some penalties, but, you know... Uh, I was always very confident, and I didn't have that confidence after that. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's. I saw another story of that Barcelona phoned him up. You know, this was quite recently to to get him to give Neymar some advice about how to teach penalties. So you know, this isn't just a Lazio thing or an Italian football thing. Really, he really is very held in very high esteem with those penalties. But free, free kicks Alistair, as well. Alistair, for example, when I moved to England. And, you know, other journalists was asking me, oh, which team are you, etc. I expected everybody to say, ah, yeah, Paul Gascoigne. Everybody said Beppe Signori. You know, my, 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 my boss said, ah, yes, I'm a big fan of Beppe Signori. You know, not Gascoigne, Beppe Signori. Because in the 90s, where uh, Italian football was broadcast in England, it was Signori Sera. And so everybody remembers Beppe Signori. Well, I was, was going to say that the um, the very first game that was broadcast live in England, in the UK, on, on the Football Italia programme they made, was that Sampdoria Lazio game, which finished in a 3-3 draw with uh, lots of goals from Signori. So, 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there's a whole generation of people really uh, in the UK, like in, like in Italy, obviously, who have kind of grown up watching him do his stuff. Um, I think we should get on to the summer of 1995. So this is after, what, this is three, three years into his time at Lazio, and this is probably the most famous part of his, his time at Lazio in terms of off-field anyway. Um, per Nielsen wrote to us about this. He said, I'd like to hear about the failed transfer to Parma. Back then, English news about Lazio was not easy to find in Denmark, you can imagine. Um, was it the ultras who pre- prevented the transfer? Um, so, do you want to kind of sum up the story and, and what happened there? Well, basically what happens uh, in that period, Cragnocchi was the owner of Lazio and Tansi was the owner of Parma. And Parma and Lazio were two big team at the moment. And the relationship between Tansi and Cragnocchi was huge. And, uh, you know, Cragnocchi thought to make money, it was the perfect time to sell, to sell Beppe Signori. And so he made a deal with Parma. Now, I don't remember how much money, but it was a lot of money. 30 millions, something like that. I think it was uh, 20, 22. Something I, I don't remember very well. But, you know, the, the, I think this is going to be the only one, the only time that fans stop, it, stop a deal like that. And as I said at the beginning, Beppe Signori was really the idol. He wasn't only the captain. He was really, you know, everybody, every Lazio fan loved, loved Beppe Signori because uh, before Signori, Lazio was struggling at the Derby. We had like five years in a row with draws at the Derby. And then finally, Beppe Signori comes and Lazio start winning derbies. And he starts scoring in the derbies. I remember he played a derby with his ankle injured. He shouldn't have played. He was able to play and scored, you know. This is the type of things that drive a Lazio fan crazy. And so when, when I, I remember I was in Rome still because I think it was in July, something like that. And a f- friend called me and said, hey, have you read the news? And I said, yeah, it's unbelievable. We have to go- do something. And he said, yeah, we're all going under the Lazio uh, house to, to protest, etc. And, you know, the day afterwards, the Corriere Sport uh, came out with this page, the set, the with all Lazio fan invading the, the area, saying Beppe Signori cannot be sold, etc. And uh, <laughs> Cragnotti was forced to not sell uh, Signori. He was so upset. He said he was selling the club. He never did, obviously. But, you know. It's, it's worth it's clarifying, though. It's, as far as I'm aware and from the reports I've read from the time, Although there were thousands of fans outside the club offices, like you say, it wasn't. Um, this wasn't a protest of people setting things on fire and smashing windows and stuff. It was, from my understanding, yeah, more yeah, or less no, no. a peace, a peaceful protest of people making their um, their opinions heard. So when we use words like force and so on, it's it, it wasn't really a case of the fans forcing him to back down. It was just that the pressure of the fans was so much that um, that they did. Which is extraordinary, like you say. Yeah, there were uh, there was this protest, people saying, "Ah, we are not doing the season tickets if he sells Signori, and things like that." So uh, nothing, nothing got damaged. No fights with the police, etc. But yeah, I mean, nev- nothing like that happened after that, you know. And uh, it's it was funny because Signori was in Brazil because. Lazio was playing friendly matches there because uh, Cagnotti had Chirio and bought a company that was Bombril, that was part of the Chirio, that was a Brazil company. And so for that reason, Lazio was doing friendly matches in Brazil. So Signori was uh, completely away from there. But he saw that from the newspaper what, what was happening. And, you know, uh, obviously he didn't ask to leave. He was very attached to Rome. Uh, but yeah, it was something <laughs> simply unbelievable. And there were mobile phones at that time. Uh, so, y- you know, it was really people uh, talking to, to, to f- going to houses and say, hey, they're selling Signori, we have to protest and things like that. It was massive. It was simply unbelievable. And this proved you how much fans were attached to Beppe Signori. Well, I was going to say, I mean, 
it, it's an amazing thing to have happened and it shouldn't be well I mean I don't think anyone would take it for granted but the fa- it shouldn't be overlooked the fact that it was for Signori that this has happened this hasn't happened before or since I mean what was it about him that you think made the <laughs> made the fans like that you know the fact that they were willing to stage such a pr- protest such such a resistance as opposed to this happening in a way that like I say hasn't really happened since then hasn't happened but there's lots of players last you've sold since then who we've been angry about but there's never been quite anything quite like this before uh, as I said at the beginning Beppe Signori was the leader he was the thing the play that changed things you know Lazio was a small team with Signori changed Lazio started beating big teams Milan, Juventus, etc. And Signori was giving everything on the pitch and wasn't hiding, you know. He 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 wasn't, uh, you know, an actor. You could tell easily when Signori was upset or when he was happy, when he was giving everything. Um, for Nesta, it was different. Uh, he, w- on the pitch, except maybe Lazio Milan when he scored in the Coppa Italia final, he didn't give that impression uh, that Beppe Signori gave. Uh, there was really a sort of attachment between Signori and the fans at that time. Um, so, yeah, I think he was the symbol of the team and the fans didn't want to lose him. Yeah, and I think it's particularly impressive given that he's not a homegrown hero. He's not even Roman. I mean, I think he's from Bergamo or somewhere. A place right near there, yeah. Yeah. Um, which makes it even more remarkable what happens, you know, the, the 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 stages of this story really from being a pretty unknown guy with quite a lot to prove when he first arrived to being someone that the fans are willing to march in their thousands only three years later to stop him from being sold. I mean, it says an awful lot about how important he was. But, um, I mean, moving on a bit... Uh, moving on, uh, when, when was it? The summer of 97, I think I'm right. Uh, that was when Svenjör and Eriksson arrived. And, and this is one of these kind of strange kind of historical events, I suppose, in a way, in that Eriksson's arrival, um, I suppose, sparked the greatest era in the club's history in terms of the trophies that were won, the squad that was assembled. But at the same time, it also really meant the end for for Signori. Not immediately, but um, they didn't have a good relationship. Uh, I don't think Signori was helped that at that time he, he didn't really have... Um, he, he was having some injury problems, wasn't he? Um, and, and wasn't quite up to full fitness. But, yeah, I mean, there's some there's some strange stories around this. I saw that, you know, Ericsson made him warm up for half an hour and then didn't bring him on. And then he knew that his time was up and... Uh, and the club were pretty much quite keen to move him on as soon as Ericsson was through the door. So, what you mem- what are your memories of that situation? And what how did the fans react to Ericsson around that? Well, you know, from one side, um, Lazio was really going further. We said that when Beppe Signori signed, Lazio was becoming a big team. We, with Ericsson, Lazio made the final step, going and win the title. Um, as you said, Beppe Signori wasn't very fit in that period. I think the biggest problem is he was having problem with his wife at that time, and that um, had a huge impact on the pitch. But as a fan, I have to say that Ericsson didn't behave correctly with him. And we know that the relationship between Ericsson and Mancini was strong and Mancini was a leader just as Nesta, as uh, um, Signori and you could see that the two couldn't play together they couldn't play together and so last you had to make the decision and obviously as Ericsson was the boss the decision was obvious Mancini would have played and and for Signori there wasn't space And the funny thing is that even though Signori wasn't in great condition, he scored two goals in the first four matches. So, you know, he wasn't playing that, he wasn't great, but he 
she was Corey. Uh, so, as as I said, it was a pity because he deserved much more credit. And I think, you know, Ericsson was bold to make this move. And I don't know if it was the right move in the end. Uh, it's <clears throat> one of the questions, well, the comments we got on Twitter from Bruno was saying, asking us how he felt when Sven sold Beppe and saying, it obviously worked out for the best with the Scudetto, but at the time it felt like selling the soul of the club. I struggled with the decision as he was one of my football idols. And I guess the, the selling the soul of the club thing, thats it's obviously very strong emotional language, but you can, from what we've just described, when the fans blocked the Parma deal from this relationship he had with the fans, you can see where he's where he's coming from here. Do you think, um, I mean, this is just pure speculation on my part, but do you think Ericsson, as a manager coming into a new team and so on, it's almost almost like a kind of statement of his intent, almost like I'm the boss now, we're going to do things my way, and what better way of doing that than bringing in his own man and kind of side, sidelining the guy that he was expected to build his team around? So two things about that. The first one is Ericsson said in an interview recently that he thought Beppe Signor had the, a negative mindset, not a winning mindset. I'm not sure about that. Obviously, we said that Signori was the leader. The fans crowned him king of Rome. And maybe after a couple of years, he was overconfident and felt like he was, you know, the boss in town. So maybe that's why Ericsson felt that he had a negative mindset. The other one is an image that I have very clear in my mind. That year, Beppe Signori didn't play the derby. And if you remember that derby, Lazio won 3 1. Favalli was sent off after 10 minutes. And even if Lazio played 10 men down, was able to win it, it was incredible. Well, first goal of Lazio, Mancini score. And you can see the, the first player celebrating with him is Beppe Signori running from the bench and going celebrated with, with Mancini. So this tells you that he was still a leader for the club. You know, he was still part of the group. He was a real Laziale because, you know, he could be so upset and he was upset because this was the first derby he was missing and not because he was injured. Uh, but he was still there celebrating because he knew what it meant for a Lazio fan. So... That tells you why I think every fan, every Lazio fan was upset when Beppe Signori left in January. So, yeah, I think I think he, he's right, you know. We were gutted. And it was maybe an example of how football was changing. Not more, you know, the, the, the leaders, the players playing all his career with the club. Uh I always said it, it wasn't fair with Beppe Signori. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like most people felt that way. I mean, especially as well, I mean, so he did, like you say, in January, he went um, originally on loan to Sampdoria. Uh, again, another story about him driving around Rome in tears all night when he found out he was leaving <laughs> until six in the morning or something. Um because, you know, the feeling was mutual here. This wasn't just that the fans loved Beppe Signori, but that Beppe Signori loved, loved the club as well, which I think is part of the reason that everybody struggled with it so much. But then when he, when he goes to Bologna, um, I mean, we're not going to talk in detail about his time at Bologna, but I, I do think, Vittorio, it does go to show that we're talking about a guy that had an awful lot left to give. And that's the kind of sour point for me on this is that, you know, he's kind of revitalized into this player who, I mean, maybe not as prolific, but he, I, I had a look at it and he finished his time at Bologna with 67 goals in 120 games, which is more than one every two games, which is a very good return. I mean, he helped that team to UEFA Cup semi-final, a Bologna team. I mean, you know, he still had an awful lot left to give. So 
I just can't help but feeling it was an error in that not only were they misjudging the relationship side of it, but they were misjudging perhaps what he had left as a player as well, because he, he wasn't he wasn't finished by any means. No, and the thing we have to be honest is if we go and consider that type of Lazio, Lazio didn't have a striker that could score 20 goals, you know. Salas didn't score that many goals. Inzaghi had problems. Vieri stayed there only one season. Uh, Oli Crespo was a striker of that type of goals. In fact, he was the capocannonieri with Lazio. But apart from Crespo, you know, Beppe Signori was the only one who could do it. And again, I thought it was a wrong move from Ericsson. I'm not saying that Ericsson was a perfect manager. Obviously, he will be remembered as the manager who won the Scudetto. But if if we go and analyze that team in those years, I thought Lazio should have won more than one Scudetto. And maybe one of the problems was Ericsson, giving too much credit, too much power to Mancini. I don't know. So, you know, maybe maybe if if remember the year before the Scudetto, Lazio wasted a big opportunity. Maybe with Beppe Signori, things could have changed. Things could have ended differently. Um, I have a lot of memories of matches that Lazio won only thanks to uh, Beppe Signori willing to fight, you know. Beppe Signori won matches on his own a lot of time with Lazio because he hated losing. So I thought he could have been very important. And yeah, maybe Zem, uh, maybe Ericsson wanted to prove that he was the man boss and that's why he, Beppe Signori was sent off away. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, so he, he goes off to Bologna, does does very well there, gets on with the fans very well there, um, ends, it up, ends up retiring after quite short spells in Greece and Hungary, um, which I had no idea about until I looked that up earlier on today. Um, but yeah, I mean, one other part of his career before we kind of look back at the whole thing uh, was that Sean, Sean McIntosh wanted us to kind of recap his, his career with the Italy national team. He said, what were his top moments? Why only 28 appearances? For the younger fans that didn't see him play, what modern player would you compare him to? Um, a few different questions there, Vittorio, but I guess the place to start is the 94 World Cup, right? Because th that was his only major tournament. And it was one really, again, where I, I guess a manager <laughs> let him down, you might say. Well, uh, Arrigo Saki said it a couple of years later. I made a big mistake that in that year, and it was pretty obvious. I hated him. I really hated him. <laughs> and I thought a lot of Lazio fans have never forgotten Arrigo Saki's mistake. I mean, he's the top scorer of, of Serie A, and you put him left wing in a midfield of four? That doesn't make sense. And in fact, Beppe Signori said, I'm not playing there. I'm, I'm a striker. If you want to play striker, otherwise I don't play. And that was a huge mistake well, of Arrigo Saki. He only, did he not only do that before the final? Because um, he, he played most of the tournament in midfield, didn't he? Or, or on the wing, I should say. He played the first match on the winger. And obviously a lot of newspapers said, ah, Beppe Signori is terrible, why he's playing, etc. And he said, I'm, I'm fed up. I'm not happy about all this people complaining about my performance. I'm playing in a role that is not mine. I, Italy qualified to the World Cup with Beppe Signori playing there. Uh, that's not his role. And uh, I thought Saki made a terrible mistake. Yeah, and then I guess you've got that horrible irony as well of Italy ending up losing the World Cup final on penalties. And they didn't have Beppe Signori on the pitch to take one, who probably would have been their most reliable penalty taker of all. And it's the guy, I guess, who's who's up front, Roberto Baggio, who, who misses the, the memorable one. But I think that's a big part of why why his Italy career wasn't what it could have been. Um, you could might also say because of, like the earlier comment we got, um, which I said we'd come back to from Joe Freyetta, saying that, 
Well, I mean, I'll ask you if you agree with this, Vittorio, but he said he's very unlucky to play in the same era as Roberto Baggio and was, was always second to him. I suppose he means in terms of a, a national level. Would you agree with that? I mean, do you think if he wasn't competing with Baggio, he would have had more space and, and a better international career? I think it makes sense saying this, but probably with a manager more open because... Saki wanted to play only with a 4-4-2. Nothing else could exist for, for Saki. But in an open-minded manager, Baggio and Signori could have perfectly played together. Baggio could have played trequartista and Beppe Signori could have played a uh, striker near to another striker. I think that would be a best option. Again, growing up with Zeman and Saki, I think the good manager is the one that put the best players available in the best position to succeed. So this means that I have to adapt to the players I have, which Arrigo Sacchi and Zeman didn't do. If you have Beppe Signori, you have to play Beppe Signori and find a way to make him play. So I thought that was, especially in the national team, that has to be the, the, the solution. So I, I, I can't help but feel the timing was just so unlucky as well because of like you say, these problems with Saki, but also the fact that Saki was happened to be the Italy manager for both USA 94 and Euro 96. And I guess those were the two tournaments, that the major tournaments that fell um, in uh, Signori's highest peak. And so because of this, he couldn't really be a part of that. I mean, by the time France 98 comes around, he's, he's, he's already kind of gone from Lazio and... Uh, you know, we're talking about a different a different period and a different player. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Italy invested so much money in Arrigo Sacchi. Let's not forget he was the manager that changed AC Milan, transformer in a winning team, best football in the, in the world, blah, blah, blah. But I thought as a manager of the national team, and he said it, you know, he said it. He made a mistake with Beppe Signori. Now, unfortunately, we can go back and fix it. But yeah, I, I think that's the funny case where the player has no blame at all. That was simply the manager making the wrong call. And what about the question, the final question there from Sean on what, what uh, modern player would you compare him to? I mean, is there is it possible to do such a thing? Hmm. I don't know. Who is a, a speedy striker who is even good at free kicks? Because, you know, Beppe Signori was a terrible, uh, a, an amazing striker. Uh, and he was perfect at free kicks and penalties. So, don't know. Messi? No, Messi. he's different. Imagine Messi, but better. Yeah, absolutely. Less right, well... assist man, but more striker. <laughs> yeah um, and he wore boots that were too small for him didn't he so that he would have better control which I've never quite understood but um, I'm not as good at football as Beppe Signori so who am I to question his methods um, the final thing I suppose I wanted to touch on really um, looking back on his career I mean so I mean he, he ends up as Lazio's second top scorer of all time behind Silvio Piola, who admittedly is going to be quite hard for anyone to catch. Um, but 127 goals, Piola had 149. I mean, Immobile might might well catch him in time. I mean, he's only what? Uh, a quick look. He's only 11 goals behind him at the moment. So you'd expect Immobile is probably going to overtake him. But where would you say Signori ranks in terms of the best strikers in in Lazio history? Um, I mean, when you do look him up and you do some reading about him, the thing you see I find coming up against quite often is people saying this is Lazio's best striker since Giorgio Quinalia. But uh, would you even rate him higher than Giorgio Quinalia? Would you, I mean, Piola is almost impossible to rate, really, because it was such a different time. But in terms of the strikers that Lazio have had that we, we can feel like rating, where, where would you put him? Well, the thing is, the most complete striker Lazio had was Bruno Giordano 
Bruno Giordano was fast, great technique, great shot, good header. He was complete. He was perfect. Obviously, Bruno Giordano played in a very, very weak Lazio. So he wasn't able to score that many goals. Beppe Signori, if you think about it, he wasn't complete. He, he, he scored with the header a couple of times, but you couldn't say, you know, he's a, a great header. But he was terrific, and he wanted to score. He wanted to win. So I, I would say Bruno Giordano was the top, Beppe Signori and Ciro Mobile afterwards. Oh, really? You're not putting Giorgio Kinalia even in the top three? Yeah, well, you said after Kinalia, so, you know. Oh, no, I mean I mean of all time, really, to be honest. Ah, okay. Um, well, Giorgio Kinalia is the, the... I never saw him playing, but he was the striker of the first Scudetto, so you have to put him first spot, even though he didn't play that many years with the, with the, with Lazio. But, you know, he scored more goals than Pelé in the, in the U.S., league so you know he's better than Pelé so yeah I would say Kinaya Giordano Signori I guess this is a, the thing that's hard with Signori is that he like you said at the very start didn't win anything and I think that's a real shame because of all of the players in the modern era who really deserved to win something um, it was him and actually from that point onwards you wouldn't find players spending as long at the club as he did without winning anything. It's quite unlucky to have yeah. fallen in that specific time frame where he didn't manage to. So, um, Well, it, it was that kind of era where big teams were still fighting for the Coppa Italia. You know, the Coppa Italia was a trophy that in that time uh, Lazio wasn't able to, to reach the final, never. The first final we reached, Signori wasn't there and we won it. So... <laughs> That was really unlucky. The other thing I will add is that, as, as I said, Immobile with Luis Alberto are scoring a lot of goals. Signori played with Karl-Heinz Riedel, Luigi Casiraghi, uh, Mancini, Rambaudi. You know, he played with D Igor Protti. Let's not forget Igor Protti. He played with so many different strikers and he still was able to score every year, year in and year out. He, he got injured and he was still able to be capo Camnonieri with Bialli, Gullit, Van Basten, all those type of strikers. And still, he was the best. Well, that's it. I mean, finishing capo Camnonieri three times in four years is just absolutely astonishing in itself. Um, and I would say, you know, it kind of goes against anyone who suggests that because he hasn't won anything, he shouldn't be regarded as one of the all-time greats. I think he absolutely should. And I think he, he definitely, uh, yeah, it's one of the reasons I suppose that I felt like we should be talking about him tonight. But um, yeah, so that's two now, two icons down. <laughs> yep. Who's going to be the third one? Well, we'll we'll put it to the public again. If you've got any particularly strong feelings, uh, let us know. Um, people do obviously have quite different opinions on this. So uh, we're trying to kind of represent a few different eras and so on. And, and maybe we'll go even a bit further back in time with, with the poll this week. I don't know, Vittorio. Um, wow. test, test your memory a little bit more. <laughs> I will have to call my dad then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, thanks uh, to everyone who's given us feedback so far. It's greatly appreciated. It is nice to to, to be doing this really while, while the football's off and when we've got nothing else to talk about, so <laughs> gives us something to do. Well, we can talk about your lockdown if you want the next episode. I don't think anyone wants to hear that. <laughs> Unless they wanted to hear about all the slow phases of g going mad um, step by step, then uh, they're welcome to. But uh, yeah, five weeks of it, there's, there's not an awful lot to report on, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, it looks like... Football is going to be back in end of May, hopefully. So still two months nearly to go. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, we should should mention that, I suppose. I mean, uh, it's quite hard to know when to really believe these bits of news because things can change very quickly. But they are talking about the possibility of players starting training against once the current lockdown ends, which is on the 3rd of May. 
um, and then somehow getting them fit enough in three weeks to play a game every three days for the rest of the season, which I do not think sounds particularly safe, but uh, appears to be the option they're going with. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be really hard for Lazio because, as we said, Lazio hasn't got a deep bench and playing every three days, it's going to be complicated for Lazio. Well, the first thing I thought when I saw this was that if we're ever going to see Bastos playing as a striker, this is going to be it. <laughs> Not a decanio, Bastos. Okay. <laughs> Guys, if you want that we talk about Bastos as Lazio icon next Monday, you know what you do, what you have to do. <laughs> I'll just stop voting. I'll just put him down as four of the four <laughs> options in the book. Four Bastos. <laughs> Uh, again, Alistair, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Remember, please rate and subscribe the podcast on iTunes. Please, five stars if you like it. you find us even on Spotify, on a Spreaker, uh, on iTunes, obviously, and on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe even to our YouTube channel. And if you want to support us, Lazio, uh, we are on a Patreon, patreon.com slash Lazio Lounge. Subscriptions start as two dollars a month. So is the coffee you are missing every day. You can send it to us, and this will support our podcast. Thank you, Alizer. Uh, I don't think you're going out tonight, right? No, this. No, I, I might have a quiet one tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you as usual, and uh, good night, everybody, and forza Lazio. <laughs>